Hello everyone and welcome to Revival Centre Church TV and it's great to be here this afternoon and uh, we're coming to you live from Box Hill in Melbourne and uh, today we've got a live chorus session so we're encouraging you to sing along with us. We've got a special program today and we're calling our program today The Light We Shine. But before we start our choruses we're going to have a word of prayer. Lord we thank you for this opportunity where we can gather together Lord, you've taken us out of this world, you've given us hope, you've given us direction, you've given us something to yearn for, and that is your return. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us here this day as we sing your praise and all the people said. Now, we're not too sure whether this is a holographic chorus session, so we're going to hand over now to Joel. Let's see what happens. They rush on the city, they run on the wall. Great is the army that carries out his word. They rush on the city, they run on the wall. Great is the army that carries out his word. But the Lord utters his voice before his army. The Lord utters his voice before his army. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. And sound the alarm. They rush on the city, they run on the wall. Great is the army that carries out his word. They rush on the city, they run on the wall. Great is the army that carries out his word. The Lord of his voice before his army. His voice before his army. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Blow the trumpet in everybody, wherever you may be. I hope you're feeling well today and are joining in with the singing. We've only got a few people here in the audience, so uh, I hope they're all going to sing extra loud for me. And, uh, you know, join in from your couch. We want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see See, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step, we're moving forward, little by little, taking ground. Every prayer, powerful weapon, strongholds come, the tumbling. see Jesus lifted high. We're gonna see, we're gonna see, we're gonna see Jesus lifted high. Great is the Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord delights in those who fear Him. But their hope in His unfailing love. Strengthens the bars on your gates, grants you peace in your borders, he reveals his love to his people, he has a miss for no other nation, great is the Lord, the mighty in power, his understanding has no limits, next on the Lord of Jerusalem, praise your God, your people. 
Well done. I'm assuming everyone's joining in. And if you're doing the dishes or something, that's right. You can sing at the same time. Bring your song to the Lord by His Spirit and from His Word. Lift your voice and rejoice for our God is a mighty King. So come and clap your hands, raise a shout as we stand before the Lord. His mighty God, His strength and victory. So as we hail the King and let His praises ring, and bring a song of joy before the Lord. Bring a song to the Lord by His Spirit and from His Word. Lift your voice and rejoice, for our God is a mighty King. So come and clap your hands, raise a shout as we stand before. You know it's time to praise the Lord in the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. So set your mind on Him and let your praise begin, and the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise and the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Don't you know it's time to praise the Lord? Excellent. All right. We're going to sing Live Out Loud now. The skies are on the floor, and the signs are all around, it gives us pause. The time is nearly over, before all is said and done, if we must shout aloud the truth of what's to come. So stand proud among the nations, and sing loud to all creation, show them how to find salvation, and the time's
few sort of past convention theme songs going on in this chorus session. It's nice, I like it. This next one was from a, a number of years ago. Now this one's called One Body. We are one body, one church purchased by His own blood. One spirit, one faith unified by His love. In unity we sing praises to our God and King. With one voice we proclaim loud His words in His name and in His unity. That's perfect liberty. We've got one future, one path, and we walk on in faith. One body, one church unified by His grace. One body, one church purchased by His own blood. One spirit, one faith unified by His love. In unity we sing praises to our God and King. With one voice we proclaim loud His words in His name and in His unity. Let's One path and we walk on in faith. One body, one church unified by His grace. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. slow things down a little bit now. We're going to sing Above All. Above all powers, above all kings, above all Rejected 
Sing, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will stay. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Right, we've got just a couple more to go now. 
This one's that one. That's why we praise him. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word of life. He came to die so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise to show his power and love. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer. our final chorus and this is normally when I tell everyone to stand up but um, yeah if everyone here could stand up please and everyone at home stand up or you know I can't see you so I'm just going to assume that you, you are in the spirit of being here with us we're going to sing Rock of Ages There is no rock there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock and there is no God like us. There is no rock. There is no God like our God. They cannot be moved He's proven himself to be faithful and true There is no rock There is no God like us Rock of ages Jesus is the rock Rock of ages Like 
Thank you. As I walk into the hologram, I think this is a digital occasion. Jared, play a note just so. Yep, we are legit. We're going to praise our Lord together, and I'm going to take a chance. We'll sing I Am Redeemed like we normally would. Let's praise our Lord now. Hallelujah. Come on now. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, again, we thank you for this opportunity where we can gather, Lord, and uh, look into your scriptures and look into the good news, and we can understand that we are placed where you want us to be. Lord, we thank you for this time and we thank you that we can praise your name this day. Let's praise him again. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Let's sing, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. Come on now. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. And I know I am. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Saved from sin and I know I am. All my sins are washed away. Praise the Lord. And again now. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. And I know I am. And I know I am. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Saved from sin and I know I am. All my sins are washed away. Praise the Lord. Everybody says, thank you to our wonderful uh, people there. And you, those in the audience here today, you may be seated. And again, for those out there in Revival Centre Church TV broadcast land, that's great we can be with you again. And uh, probably midweek, we might have some more um, information from the state government here in Victoria, whether we'll be able to uh, open things up a little bit more for you next week. But, uh, but for today, we've got a great opportunity to gather together and... Uh, it's a slightly special occasion that we're calling this kind of like a mini rally. This is when we used to have our, our long weekend rally and people come from all over Australia and all over the place. But what we're doing here is instead of just having one preacher here this afternoon, we've got a theme and that's called The Light We Shine. And it's uh, specifically about who we are as a church in the ether of, of, the, of Christendom, if you want to put it that way. And uh, if you don't know who we are as a church, this is your day to uh, log on in one sense and have a listen to all these things because uh, as a group of people, we believe that there are fundamentals and incidentals in Scripture. It isn't hit or miss. We need to do what our God wants us to do. And uh, we believe in the revival centres that on the day of Pentecost, it was the beginning of the Christian church and we're going to hear about this today. And that was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that is the reason Jesus came. He was sent by the Father. He, uh, he ministered for three and a half years and he talked about the kingdom to come. And uh, he spoke to Nicodemus and said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. And uh, sadly, around the world of religion, there are very or there are many anomalies. And uh, there aren't a million different ways to get to the Lord in Ephesians, we're told there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one hope, etc., etc., etc. In Jude chapter 3, a wonderful verse, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And uh, as a group of people around the world, we believe that that is our mandate that is our commission. We've been called to preach the gospel with signs following. And so today we've got a number of our younger pastors that, that are going to minister to us on some set topics that are related to that theme. And throughout the day, I'm going to be just mentioning a few things like fundamentals and incidentals. One of the things that's important to embrace in uh, getting to know God and following God is that doctrine or God's teaching or directions or commandments do matter. 
And we're living in a world now where people have uh, designer religions. They've got every angle that they want to have. But it's all about what God wants us to be. God wants us to do. We're going to talk to you about salvation. We're going to talk to you about the wonderful gift of receiving the Holy Spirit with the Bible evidence of speaking in other tongues. I'm going to mention something called the Yellow Book Teaching a little bit later on. License to sin. And that's a very important topic and the way we conduct ourselves in our meetings and our, our Lord and the Apostle Paul there under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he spoke that all things should be done decently in order and that, uh, and that has great consequence if we uh, don't follow what he says as well. Anyway, our first speaker today, one of our younger pastors, he's going to talk about his topic is the light that we shine on salvation. It's my pleasure to introduce Pastor Joel Hume. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. As Pastor Simon says, it's uh, my privilege today to talk about the light we shine on salvation. And the light we shine, uh, there's sort of two angles. I'm going to look at one of them today. There's two angles. You know, we know that the Word is a light to our feet, so that the Scripture illuminates uh, is a light. We also know Jesus said that He is the light. So when Jesus said, I and the Father come make our abode in you, what that means today is when you receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is a light as well. And these two things, of course, they always agree. The, the Word, what's in the Word, and the Spirit that you have. I want to look a little bit at the Word um, today and just in terms of we're talking about salvation and, and what, what the Word says, but also uh, more a way, of, a way of looking into the Word as well um, because salvation is one of those things it's it's a fundamental you know component of the, of the christian experience it is you know paul said you know if, uh, paul said you know if, if if it's only about this life i'm more miserable than anybody so he understood the importance of salvation and what the big picture was um and really salvation means that you go from being separate from god to being part of god's family unfortunately Salvation is not something that's widely understood. Um, so, what, you know, what do you do when, you, when you're looking up these sort of things? You know, you've got a topic. What, are, what do people do when they have a question? I'll tell you what they do when they have a question. They Google it. So, that's exactly what I did. I jumped on, you know, and Googled, how do I know if I'm saved? And I went through and I sort of read, you know, read through this page and that page. And I probably read, you know, the top 20 results on Google. And what there was sadly and this is why it's not widely understood there was a lot of people's opinions there was a lot of views there was a lot of uh, scriptures in isolation but what there wasn't was a lot of what we're going to look at now is is somebody taking all of the scriptures all of the word of God in its totality and understanding the balance and where all the pieces fit together I sort of read through and read through and I got to one and, and I'm going to quote this one. I'm not having to go at this person, they don't know, but I got to this quote and it said, don't feel your way into your beliefs, believe your way into your feelings. And I've still got no idea what that means and I'm not having to go at that person, but just pointing out the fact that there is a lot of confusion out there. So any chance we get to shine a light on something as fundamental as our salvation... That is an important job that we do. I've got a few scriptures here. I'm going to read through them quickly. It just in the, in the um, you know, under the, under the banner, if you like, of scriptures that if you take them in isolation and scriptures that have been taken in isolation will lead you up the wrong path, okay? So we're just going to flick through these. We've got Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then we go to John three sixteen. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you should be saved. Acts 16.31 says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house. And finally, there's others, but this is just a few that I picked. John 5, 24, verily, verily, this is Jesus, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me, that's God, has everlasting life. And so what we've got there is a selection, and there's others, but there's a selection of scriptures, 
all of those scriptures point to salvation. All of those scriptures talk about being saved, salvation, eternal life. They're all pointing in the same direction. And, and the other common theme is all of those scriptures have taken, been taken to be at one time or the other as this is how it's done. This is what you have to do. You have to believe. You have to confess the name Jesus. Um, you have to give your heart to Jesus. There's another one. There's all of these different ones. And there's many others like these. But the question is, which one is it? Which one of those five that I read out, and there's plenty of others, which one is actually the way to salvation? I'm going to give two, two little ideas today. The first one is uh, this thing called reductionist thinking. Okay, so reductionist thinking is when you take a complex system and you try and view the parts, some part of that system, as though that can be viewed in isolation. Okay? So an example, something like uh, the environment. So the environment is an incredibly complex system. As humans, we've got really not that much of an idea of how it all works. Um, we take something like, uh, here's an example, in, in, in Queensland, there was a beetle that was eating the sugar cane. We thought it would be a good idea to introduce cane toads um, to, 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 to attack this little beetle and kill it. You know, great idea. The problem is the cane toad doesn't have any natural predators and now they reckon there's about 200 million of them all across Queensland. It's an absolute disaster. They've got no natural predators. They're toxic to all of the natural animals. As humans, we didn't consider the whole system. We took this part as though we could play with this one part of it in isolation and it's an absolute mess. The other reason I wanted to mention the cane toads is because New South Wales flogged Queensland on Wednesday. So Pastor Darcy, Pastor Justin, that one's for you, cane toads. Um, humans, I don't know why, but we take this reductionist view on co whether it's medicine, whether it's supplements, whether it's the environment, all of these complex systems, we try and boil it down to this one little part. It's this, it's that, we can tinker with that and it's not going to have any impact. If you do that in the environment, it's a tragedy. If you do that with scriptures, it's a tragedy. We cannot take parts out of the system without viewing how they interact with the system as a whole. You can end up telling someone that they're saved when they're not. And that is a tragedy. What's the, uh, what's the solution? Okay, it's almost, you know, it's almost the opposite. It's, it's an antonym, if you like. We're going to talk about holistic thinking. That's the opposite because that's where you do actually say, no, this whole system, we can only explain parts of a system by considering the whole of the system. The parts of a system are interconnected and explained only by reference to the whole system. And the, I'm just going to talk about this today in terms of what I'm going to call jigsaw thinking. So if you take a jigsaw, this is what I used to do. I used to get a jigsaw and you get the box and you tip all the pieces on the ground and then you'd go and you'd get two pieces, two random pieces, and you'd try and join them together. And if they didn't join together, obviously they weren't meant to join together and they weren't part of the puzzle, so you'd throw them in the bin and you'd go and grab another two pieces and, you, and you'd try again. And that doesn't work, Let, you know, hot, hot tip for all of you out there. That doesn't really work. But how a jigsaw puzzle does work is all of the pieces in the right place are needed. If you take this piece, this piece, this piece and put them in a random spot, you are going to have no idea what the jigsaw puzzle is about. But when you get all of the pieces in the right place, that's when you know what the picture is. You need, you're not choosing which pieces of the jigsaw puzzle matter. Those ones don't matter, that one does matter. We'll use those, we'll leave those pieces out. No, you need all of the pieces in the puzzle. And that's where we get to this idea that the scriptures are additive. The scriptures build together. The scriptures don't cancel each other out. Jesus even said that the scriptures cannot be broken. We understand this, but all of the scriptures go together to build a picture of what it all, you know, what it all means of, of, of salvation in the case of my topic today. What is salvation? You need to look at the, look at the whole picture. Does that mean you need to know every verse in the Bible? No, but they do all matter. We'll just refer, if, you, if you're taking notes there, Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. 
read it in your own time, but basically it says don't add and don't subtract. Don't add to what's written and don't subtract from what's written. Don't leave things out. And so I've just got a little, you know, a quick little exercise now. I've just got three uh, characteristics, if you like, of God's salvation. And these are by no mean no means uh, exhaustive. It's not, you know, all of it. What I've actually just done is taken three scriptures to make a little demonstration here. So we've got, the first one is 1 Corinthians 4, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Okay, God is not the author of confusion. So if salvation is designed to save, which is what the word means, if salvation is designed to save, it cannot be confusing. Number two, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, wasn't just talk, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And so we come back to this question, am I saved? If you're saved, you will know because there's power and there's assurance in that experience. Number three here, we've just got 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, is beneficial for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If it's all inspired by God, who are we to leave bits out? Who are we to pick and choose? It's been inspired by God. It's there for a reason. And so... That, that's just three characteristics that I've picked and, and there, there's dozens and dozens, please don't take that the wrong way, that is not the list of what salvation looks like, that is just how we build a picture using scriptures because it's all of those and there's dozens and dozens and dozens of other scriptures which you can use to build this picture of what salvation looks like, it needs to be, and just those three points, it needs to be clear and simple, not confusing, it needs to have power and assurance, more than just words, and it needs to include all of the scriptures. Nothing is omitted and nothing is contradicted. Every piece of the jigsaw puzzle matters. Every piece of the jigsaw puzzle gets added together to see the whole picture. And so then as far as salvation goes, we've got this call to action. So this is in Acts chapter 2. Uh, this is Peter on the day of Pentecost. He's quoting the prophet Joel. So when we start here, we've got Acts 2.16. Um, I feel like I've referred to this a few times recently, but that's all right. Acts 2.16, this is Peter, and this is Peter. So we read those scriptures out at the start. Actually, we'll read it first. Um, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And we'll just pass through to verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so we've got this concept, if you like, verse 21 there, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a fundamental principle because what that means is salvation is for everyone, okay? Whoever calls out, salvation is for everyone. That was the prophet Joel. Peter refers to it. Paul refers to it in Romans chapter 10 as well. And it's an important statement. It's a fundamental statement. But it's a conceptual statement in a lot of ways. Because what it doesn't have, it gives you this big picture view. It doesn't have an action in a sense. It says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what, the, what, what Peter's doing on, on the day of Pentecost is he's taking a tangible, physical, something they can see and hear, they, they saw what was happening. They saw people receiving the Spirit. They saw the evidence. They saw the power. They saw people speaking out in tongues and prophesying. They saw all of this happening. And what Peter did, we said, you know what Joel said? The prophet Joel, and they would have all known this, this, this you know, what the prophet Joel said. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what you're seeing. So he took it from a concept in a sense to being something tangible that they could see with their own eyes and, and hear with their own ears. But he goes on. He goes on and in verse 37, they say, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart 
and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were in. They saw it. They were pricked in their hearts. And they said, what do we do next? What's the next steps? And this is where Peter has gone from the concept to the tangible, what they see in here. He gives them a direct action. These are, this is the next steps. This is what you've got to do. In verse 38, Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of the sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what the prophet Joel was talking about when he said, Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He was talking about this experience. And that's what Peter says. He says, you want that? You've got to get baptized. You've got to repent and you'll receive the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. And that is, um, and that is the, the link. That is, that is Peter taking it from the concept to the tangible and then to the action, to the next steps for those people that were there. And of course, that's our next step as well. If you haven't yet received the Holy Spirit, that is your next step, to repent to be baptized and you will receive the Holy, Holy Ghost. Verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children, and again, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's to everybody, to you, to your children, and to all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so Peter took it from being this concept to being this action, this simple action that people take in faith and if you take that action in faith God will answer you and you'll know you will know that you've been answered and so the light we shine on salvation is the word the word is a lamp as we know and I've just sort of hope you've understood that today what I've been trying to talk about is the fact that we use scripture to interpret the scripture all of these scriptures are important and all add together to build that picture you don't need to know the whole Bible, but you do need to understand that every scripture is important. If you want to boil it down, if you haven't yet received the Holy Spirit, you take those next steps. Repent and be baptized and you will receive the Holy Ghost. All of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are needed to see the whole picture. And I've just got a couple of points here just to finish on what God's salvation is. God's salvation is simple. God's salvation is clear. God's salvation is direct. God's salvation is powerful. God's salvation is personal. God's salvation is eternal. And God's salvation is for you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Joel. All the people said, thank you for that voluminous, is that the word? I don't know, a uh, round of applause. Look, at, uh, there's a wonderful message there and uh, he said it perfectly, you know, you can receive the Holy Spirit today no matter where you are. And that is a feature of knowing God. It's just the beginning, it's just the ticket. And uh, when we worship in spirit and in truth, we are given this capacity to pray in tongues and this, this prayer language of the Holy Spirit and we build ourselves up in our faith and we come to know who we are in Christ. And uh, I'm going to, uh, just in a moment, uh, just so you understand the, uh, the makeup, we have three centres in Melbourne and we have a, a group that fellowship down at Mount Eliza and we call that our southern centre. We also have a centre across in the western area of Melbourne at Braybrook, correct? And uh, Pastor Dave, he's going to come up now and share his story of him receiving the Holy Spirit and bring some encouragement to us as well. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Okay, so today is Sunday and, and two nights ago, Friday night, um, I was sitting with a family, we'd, we'd had dinner and uh, we were just talking and my wife said uh, to the rest of the family that she had a problem. And she said, my problem is that I've got these um, sort of flashing, she described it as lightning in her eyes and a lot of debris in her eye. eye. And she asked for prayer. And um, now the backstory is, if I can pause that for a moment, three years ago, my wife had these same eye issues, lightning and stuff in her eyes. And it turned out that it was um, signs... It, 
they, she went to an, opt what are they, what are they, an eye doctor, can't think of the name, but they said, this is signs possibly of your retina detaching. And um, it was a lot of trouble and strife, and it, it took months to resolve that. Anyway, she says this to the family, that backstory is not in my mind in any way. I don't remember it, I'm not thinking of it. And she said, can we have some prayer? And it was very casual, and we said, yeah. And we prayed for a moment, and that was it. The next morning, she said, hey, family, my eye is completely better. And she reminded us of what had happened three years ago. And really, this is a, my testimony is the Lord being present in my life in every aspect. Every single aspect of my life is, is touched by the Lord. And he is the bedrock of everything I do. And it's as simple and as accessible as that, really. And my story began when I was 17 years old and I uh, had an older brother who in many ways had sort of lost his way in life and was uh, just really in quite a mess. But I, he, he came home and said that he'd started going to this church and he started to talk about things that confused me and bothered me. Baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, none of which I was comfortable with. But what interested and intrigued me was the difference I saw in him. And over the, a process of six months... I watched him and I ended up coming along to a meeting and having that experience, receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and being baptised. And for me, my life was redirected into this new reality. And, and when I think about how does the Lord affect my life, he affects my relationship with my wife. He, he completely affects my relationship with everyone around me, my kids, the way I am at work. He has a direct effect on anxiety, fear. Every single thing that I go through, the Lord is my bedrock. And um, one of the great things that I, I love about the relationship with the Lord is it's not about following people. I don't, I didn't follow my brother. I don't follow Pastor Simon. Probably comes as a shock to him. <laughs> Um, it's about my relationship with God. To illustrate that point, in this hall, my oldest child, who's now an adult, is watching me speak. And I've seen her grow up as a kid and then get to a point at maybe 11 years old where she took on things that her parents were saying. She received the Holy Spirit. She had this experience. And she, her relationship with the Lord has absolutely nothing to do with me or anyone else. And, and, and we talk like this because what Pastor Joel was saying in that talk is salvation is for absolutely everybody. And um, if you're hearing this, you may be hearing this for the first time, you may know people who have had this experience, but our, our encouragement is to understand that this is about you and God and this is about you having that bedrock in your life, whatever your situation is, we cannot recommend anything as highly as this. So take the step to find out, have a conversation. Lives are changed through that first conversation. And that's my testimony. Amen. What about a round of applause for Pastor Dave, eh? Great testimony, great thoughts there. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about the word salvation and uh, Pastor Joel was mentioning that and I just throw out there a question, save from what? What, what does that exactly mean? And uh, in the big picture, we're actually saved from our own mortality. We're saved from our humanity, you know. And the Bible says, and Jesus spoke to a particular lady at the well, and, and she, he, he said to her that you must worship me in spirit and in truth. And, and this is the whole thing, you know, God created all things and we are subject to our mortality, you know, we're, we're subject to COVID-19. We're, we're subject to the things that go on around us. And God isn't. He's a spirit. And the word of God says, and when you sort of patch it all together, that uh, technically speaking, or not technically, the reality is that we are dead in trespass and sin. This is our mortality. And we're not going to live forever. We're on borrowed time. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, like Pastor Joel was talking about on the day of Pentecost, 
there is this wonderful opportunity to step into the world of God. And God is a spirit and he changes us in the physicality of it. We don't probably look very different. We probably got a smile on our face, of course. But the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. And it says there in 1 Corinthians 15 that in the twinkling of an eye, will be changed and will be like him. And so it's important to understand when you're considering these things, what it is we're saved from. And just think about that as well. All right, we're going to move to our next uh, speaker. And uh, he's here in Box Hill. And this is Pastor Joel Murray. And his uh, topic is the light that we shine on temperance. Let's make him welcome. Thank you. Okay, good day, everyone. Right. Well, yeah, we're going to be talking about the light that we shine on temperance. Now, temperance is a bit of an old-fashioned word. You probably don't use it in your day-to-day -day life. Um, it's one of the fruit of the Spirit, so it, it's important. Often, when you might, you might hear it in regards to abstaining from alcohol. That's probably the only time, really, that it gets used. It means basically self-control. So we, we need to have self-control. We need to abstain from, from sin, from the things that God says for us not to do. Um, and that's, so that's what we preach, which is, which is a shame. Because a lot of other religious organisations, it seems like it's not that big a deal at times. You know, you do the wrong thing, you do something dumb, and you can just, you know, forgive. You know, you, you just admit and off you go again. Or even better, you get to blame it on something else in the first place. You get to say, oh, the devil made me do it. It wasn't my fault, it was this other thing, some external thing. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, instead of admitting to the, to the bigger charge, or the bigger thing that you did wrong, you get to just admit that, oh, I let the devil in and that was, that was my sin. The other thing was, was sort of out of my control. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds like a bit of a joke, and actually it is, because apparently it was popularized. I looked it up, you know, the devil made me do it. I looked up what, where that came from. Apparently it came from a comedian. Well, he popularized it. His name's Flip Wilson. I don't actually know the guy. Um, in the 60s, 70s, you, you may remember it. Um, yeah, he did outlandish things and then said, oh, the devil made me do it. Um, but the thing is, I'm, I'm going to explain a joke, which always makes it not funny at all. It's the reason why it's a joke is because it's ridiculous. It's absurd. The idea that you become a Christian, you, you know, accept God and you know, you, you're sort of living a more moral life and suddenly you're not responsible for your actions? Like, that's ridiculous. And, and isn't it funny how the people that, that seem to have the insights are the ones who benefit from it? You know, there's the... the the politicians that they don't agree with, oh, they have the devil. They've got it. I can see the devil. There's a devil in this, in this auditorium. It's like, it's a whole bunch of red flags. You know, if, if it benefits the person that's saying it, no one else can actually see this devil that they're referring to. Surely, big red flag. What does the Bible say? Okay. I looked up these sort of key words. One of them that I looked up was demon. There we go. And uh, actually, it only is referred to in the Bible once. And I'll show that to you. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. And it says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power. That's the only place. And of course, I'm being silly. That doesn't actually refer to demons at all. Okay. It, I looked up devils. Devils is in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it mentions devils four times. And always it's talking about strange gods. It's talking about idols, things that are not of God. They are strange idols. And that's the only time that it's referred to as, as devils in the Old Testament. Satan in the Old Testament is mentioned 19 times, but pretty much all in Job. Outside of that, there's only a handful. Um, it just sort of wasn't much of a thing in the Old Testament. It wasn't mentioned much. Uh, does that mean that when people did the wrong thing, did that mean that people didn't ever do the wrong thing in the Old Testament? Not at all. <laughs> people did the wrong thing in the Old Testament all the time, but it was on them when they did. So, let's look at the New Testament. What happened in the New Testament? It actually is mentioned a bit more times. 
devil, Satan, these sorts of things are mentioned in the New Testament. And we're going to have a look at some of them. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24. Okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, and it says, here's an example of how it's used, and it says, And his fame went throughout all Syria, we're talking about Jesus here, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. It's mentioned like this, you know, we see that it's possessed by devils and these sorts of things. That sort of scripture is, 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 it's mentioned that a few times, where it's listed in amongst all these other sicknesses, and Jesus healed them. Okay, w- w- there's a few more with, with some more detail, and we'll go into that. Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 32, uh, okay, and he, here's a, a direct example, and it says, and as, as, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil, And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. And the next one's interesting, but the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. So there's a a, a dumb man who wasn't wasn't able to speak, and Jesus healed them. It's in amongst all these other things where Jesus healed these people. Um, The... There's another one in Matthew chapter 12. We're not going to look at it, but it's someone who's who's blind and dumb. And and again, Jesus healed them. There's another one in Matthew chapter 17. We'll quickly look at this one. Uh, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 14. Okay, and it says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. He's very sick. For oft times he falleth in the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the, co- the child was cured from that very hour. So here, here's another example. We're not talking about people doing dumb things and then trying to blame it on something else. We're talking about really sick people. People who need Jesus to heal them, and he did. You know, we, we have a lot of terms nowadays for people who are sick, you know, people, all sorts of different diseases and stuff. They didn't have so many back then. You know, that, um, that uh, we have, yeah. Back then, you've, you've got the things that are visible, and here you can see the devil is sort of used as something that we can't see. You know, it's, it's, something's wrong with this person, don't know exactly what it is. And you, you sort of you see how it was used, and it, it's actually Jesus wasn't the first one to use the, these terms. The Pharisees we saw in the last two examples, the Pharisees said, "Oh, he's casting out devils because of the, you know, on on behalf of the devils." So the Pharisees were using this term. The people, you know, narrating, writing the, the scriptures were using this term. Um, it was vernacular. That was how people referred to it back in the day. You know, it wasn't used in the Old Testament. They didn't they didn't use that sort of vernacular in in this scenario yes they did um but you notice that these are very sick people now there are other times there's a few weird ones but we don't have time to go through every example um you may notice that uh when you you know the story about judas betraying jesus it says in in luke chapter 22 it says that um before he went ahead with it it said that satan entered judas it also says in acts chapter 5 about if you know the story about ananias and sapphira um, it says that, uh, yeah, that when they're talking to Ananias, he, he says, oh, hath, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie? Now, it's, it's sort of saying, as in the Old Testament, you know, they, they went away from God. They made decisions that were not godly whatsoever. And you can definitely see that in here. You know, that it's, they're, they're making some, some choices that are just dumb. Um, but for a second, let's play... Let's play devil's advocate, literally. Okay, let's assume that, you know, maybe, I don't know how it's said that it worked, you know, devil on the shoulder or whatever, whispering, I don't know how it works. Let's assume that maybe, 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 it is some sort of literal thing. Okay, now, it's not consistent because it's saying, consistently is that they just did something natural. But let's, let's assume that here they're talking actually literally. In both the case of Judas and Ananias and Sapphira, 
it didn't make a difference. The fact that it mentions Satan and that sort of thing, they still suffered the same consequences. It wasn't a case of, oh, you got off lightly because, oh, you know, someone's whispering in you. It didn't matter. I mean, in all three cases, they died. Like, that's serious consequences. So you can't go blaming someone else for you doing dumb things. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. Whether it's Old Testament, New Testament, whatever, when people did dumb things, there were consequences. Now, we, sh- we can't go too far without mentioning this one scripture. James chapter 1, this one's... Whenever you're talking about this sort of thing, this explains it all. James chapter 1 and verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say that he is tempted, that when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err. I mean, that sort of sums it up. Where if you feel, you know, compelled to do something which you know is dumb, it's not coming from anywhere else, it's coming from yourself. And here it says, um, you know, just avoid it. Uh, I've heard other pastors say, Bucket of cold water. Just get rid of the temptation whatsoever. You know, it's, you can't blame it on someone else. It is your choice. We are tempted of ourselves. Okay, we don't go blaming others for our own shortcomings. In fact, Jesus washed away all our sins. You know, so instead of looking for things to blame for what's going wrong, why are we even concentrating on, on this? We should be looking at what's gone right in our lives. There's a reason why we don't talk about this stuff very often. And that's because, as we mentioned, it's, a, it's not that relevant because the consequences are still are always there. You know, you, you, you're responsible for your own actions. But also, why are we concentrating on the sin? Why are we concentrating on these negative things? And, you know, what do we get to blame when we do something dumb? How about we don't do dumb things in the first place? Easy. Fixed. Instead, we concentrate on how God has washed away all our sins. The old life is put away and it is so much better now. We live a life that is blessed, where God is looking after us every single step of the way. And that's what we should be concentrating on. That's where we, um, where we shine our light, is that we are now saved. We don't have to worry about all that other stuff. We live a life that's right. And God, let God work out things. That's why we, yeah, and that's, we shine a light on our temperance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Joel. All the people said, I hear you at home on your couches. We've almost hit the halfway point, which is a good thing. We have an item in a moment. Just wanted to add in there, you know, that uh, at the end of uh, the book of Acts chapter 2, it says, save yourselves. The Holy Spirit had been called out, had been poured out, and people received the Holy Spirit. And save yourself means take hold of this and do something with it. And uh, the world of Pentecost, the world of charismatic churches, many of them, this saying, you know, the devil made me do it, is, and it's all very theatrical. And in fact, we're told in the book of Timothy there that uh, doctrines of devils seducing the flock. And we've got to be very careful and we've got to look into the scriptures and understand that uh, a lot of this is Hollywood induced when it comes to that. I remember years ago having a conversation with some young guys um, up, up in Queensland and uh, they were convinced that there were spooks and gremlins and goblins and whatever. And uh, I said, have you seen one? And, the, and these two guys and the, the other one said, yeah, well, I've seen one. And, and I said, well, what's it look like? And he said, oh, it's, it's black and you can see through it and it's, it's small and it flits all over the joint. And I said, wow, where did you see that? He said, I saw it in a movie. And he was serious. And I said, a lot of the things that, that we saw in, in some, some of these establishments that uh, 
they, they Hollywoodize things. They try to make a lot more out of things. And I'm not talking that, that, that there isn't a devil and bits and pieces like that. But when we receive the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is temperance, and that is self-control. And this concept that, um, that you can blame someone else for your de demise spiritually, it's just not on anymore. Once you've received the Holy Spirit, it's up to you now to walk in faith, to walk in the Spirit, to be prayerful. And you'll find things that, uh, as Pastor David was saying there, you know, it becomes your rock, your pillar, the Lord becomes part of your life, part of your family, and part of everything that you do and reflect. And uh, well done to Pastor Joel. Not an easy topic. But there again, this is one of the lights that uh, the Revival Centre Church shines on some of these things. All right, we're going to pause for a few moments now. We've got a uh, pre-recorded item. And uh, this is Ezra Haig. And he's a young man from the Hawke's Bay Revival Centre. And uh, he's going to sing a song called... Here am I, and then we'll be back with you for the second half. Well, who will hear my Saviour calling? Today, for the fields are white and the harvest waiting. So, who will go bear those sheaves away? Well, here am I, O oh Lord, send me. Here am I, O oh Lord, send me. Well, here am I. New Zealand and that was great all right we're back here again we've got our second half of our little uh, mini rally on the light we shine and uh, one of the things that uh, became very apparent to uh, the founder of our church pastor Lloyd Longfield many years ago was this the idea that uh, a church is more than an audience and a, an entertainer and uh, th this was becoming apparent in the Pentecostal world that uh, the bigger show you put on, the more, the bigger number of people you can get there and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and it got to the stage over many, many years where salvation, as you, we've had very uh, capably explained to us, became secondary to just how many people turned up, how many people put money in the, in the bin as it went past. And this idea 
that uh, church is, is an audience and you turn up and there's no consequence or anything like that became a big thing in America and, and right across the world. And uh, it's important to understand in Scripture, the Scripture talks about shepherds, it talks about pastors, it talks about caring for the flock and uh, feeding the flock which you, the Lord has purchased with his blood. And uh, what we've got now is Pastor Chris Keane, and uh, he's one of our pastors here in Box Hill. He's going to uh, minister to us the light that we shine on worship. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, g'day everyone, how are you going? I'm going to be uh, shining a light on worship today and uh, my theme scripture is 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40, uh, let all things be done decently and in order. And we're going to turn to John chapter 4 and verse 23 to start off, so if you can look that up, verse 23 it says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth and we've heard today about receiving the holy spirit and this is how we worship the lord in spirit and it's and it's from the inspiration of, and the abundance of the heart so once you've received the holy spirit worship worshiping the lord in spirit and in truth. So it's motivated by our love for God and what He's done for us and our grateful gratefulness. And when we talk about truth, you know, these things go hand in hand, spirit and truth. You know, the foundation of the gospel is truth. You know, without the truth, uh, it, there's no substance. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we have access to the Father through the Son and by the Spirit. And we know that the truth, Jesus, being the foundation of the church. You know, if we uh, look at the theme scripture being 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. You know, we look at that and we go appropriately and organized, honorably and harmonious and we'll talk about that a little bit later graciously and uniformed as a church righteously and calm you know so when we're talking about a holistic view of first corinthians we're looking at that that book in particular this is one of the letters that paul writes to the, the church of corinth and it's and it's really important to understand the concept of that time you know and what his letter was about and if we, we, you could break that uh, letter up into about six different categories. And what I want to do is, is hone in on who it was addressed to, the breakdown of the letter in a sense, and what he's addressing. But specifically, I want to look at the point where he's talking about us as saints coming together as one. And, um, you know, so coming together as, as a church. You know, so it's addressed to the Church of Corinth, and we know that there was a few things going on up there at the time. It's, although it's 1 Corinthians, it's not necessarily the first letter that Paul wrote, and he refers that in chapter 5 there. It's actually a, um, a response to a letter that was written previously. And it was talking about divisions in the church and, and moral and ethical disorders and all that sort of stuff. Um, and he talked about um, the sacrificing of food and all that sort of stuff. But he really hones in on chapters 11 to 14 about when we come together as a church or the gathering of the saints. And he's talking about the weekly worship gathering and Paul pointed out these things and he pointed out the purpose of gathering. You know, it's a place where God's spirit should be working through the church and should be evident, but it should be done in a unified way. A unified way, and he talks about the metaphor of the body of Christ and how we're all fitly jointed together. And, and he also points out that it's for the building up of the church. And that's one of the key points that he, that he talks about and should be central to the gospel message. And his love, God's love, is central to those things. And love is the key, key words of this, um, this section from 1 Corinthians 13 to 14, and amongst that is 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter as we know it. And it's talking about the agape love. 
the wide open um, agape love, which is love that is unconcerned with self and concerned with the greatest good for others, right? And it talks about agape requires faithfulness, commitment, sacrifice, and without expecting anything in return. It's an unselfish love um, grown out of God's love for us. And if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about how, um, you know, if I have, um, although I speak with tongues of men and angels, we, we heard about speaking in, in tongues and receiving the Holy Spirit, although I, I do these things and, and I don't have love or charity, you know, I'm like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So without love, these things are, you know, insignificant. You know, and although I have a gift of prophecy and all knowledge and faith, you know, if I don't have love, I am nothing. And what he's really pointing out is when we gather together, it must come from a, a, an abundance of love. And, and it's, when we come together, it is for the edification and the building up of the church. And that is the foundation of why we come together. Now, if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm just going to refer it in the NIV so it's easy to listen for those who are listening. And uh, it, it's just a great scripture to have on, the, on your fridge, but to live your life by. But what Paul's talking about is when we come together, this is fundamental. This is what it's all about. You know, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And as we know, Jesus is the truth, the foundation of the church. You know, and and it, love rejoices with the truth. And without truth, love is insignificant. It must have spirit and truth. And then we know that love is... It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and love never fails because it's based on truth and God's truth. And if you look at uh, you know, a, a loveless marriage that was based on lies, it doesn't work. You must have truth, spirit and truth, and we must come in a manner of truth and with spirit. And I'll, I'll refer to John chapter 21. This is Jesus speaking to Peter. And he's talking about, um, you know, he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you, Lord. You know, and he's talking about the agape love there. You know, do you love me? And he said, feed my lambs. And then he said, it said to Peter again, do you love me, Peter? And he says, yes, Lord, I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And he said it a third time. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, you know all things, Lord. You know I love you, you know. And he reiterates the point, feed my sheep. And what that means is when we come together, it must come from an abundance of love to give to the church, to edify the church and to build us up and strengthen us as a church. And it doesn't come from vainglory or self-seeking. It comes from abundance of love. And this is what Peter's, uh, Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians. You know, so does this... What, what Jesus says to Peter, does this, is this only relevant to Peter? No, of course not. It's, it's relevant to every one of us who are part of the body of Christ. We all come to church to build, to strengthen, and to feed the sheep, feed the flock. It's not for a pastor. It's not just for an elder, a house leader, someone of, of, a, of a leadership. No, when we come together, Paul is talking about how we come from an abundance of love to serve as like an agape love. And we'll turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll start off in verse 1 and I'll uh, hop, skip and a jump. So hopefully you keep up with me. Um, verse, verse 1, it says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So what, what Paul, Paul's talking about here is, you know, follow after love. Come to when you come together, come with love and desire spiritual gifts, but I rather that you prophesy. And he explains this a bit more. And we know that when you when we speak in tongues, first verse two it says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. And we know that that's your prayer language between you and God. 
For no, under, no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. And we know that when you, when you pray in the Spirit and you pray in tongues, your spirit prays and it builds you up. And it's, and it's for your own building of yourself. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. And Paul's talking about this is so important for us to come to church, come as a gathering to edify, to exhort or encourage or give advice, appeal and counsel and comfort. And we know this is talking about the, the, um, the voice gifts of the Spirit in this particular case. But he makes the point here. And he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifies the church. And we skip down to uh, verse 20, and a, and a point here I want to put, make. Even so, for as much as ye are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. To the edifying of the church. So we come together to build the church. Not for vain um, glory, or not for, for any, but anything else, other than to come in an abundance of love to give and to, to excel in the edification of the church. You know, and, and, he, and he talks in, in verse 18, it says, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all. And he reiterates the point that it's so important to pray in the Spirit, pray in tongues. But when we come together, he says, you know, yet I, when in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that my voice might teach others also than 10,000 words in, in an unknown tongue. In other words, back in that time, there were people that were speaking in tongues at once and it was become discord and people were prophesying at once and it was just out of place. And it wasn't unified and it wasn't harmonious. And what he's doing is he's reiterating the point, we must come in harmony, harmony and um, in, in graciousness. In verse 22, he says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. And he's talking about when we're in, in a gathering and there's someone that's, um, who, who hasn't heard these things before. But prophesying, prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So when we're coming into church and we're gathering for the edification, prophesying is for the edification of the church. Verse 23, it says, If therefore we, the whole church come together in one, in one place and all speak with tongues, and there comes someone that was unlearned or haven't heard these things before, he basically says, they would think that you're mad. right? And this is a point that he makes that when you come to church as one, it must be in harmony. It can't be in chaotic form. It must be, and this underpins how we come together, that if someone was to come in, that you can't be seen as crazy because it can put people off. And that's what he's saying here. But if you're prophesying in the sense of building the church up, people will see that the Spirit of God is in the church. And he will see these things. You know, um, verse 26, I'll jump down to there. How, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you have a psalm, have a doctrine, have a tongue. Everyone has a revelation, have an interpretation. Let all these things be done unto edifying, the building up of the church. You know, some people think that you come to church just to get a spiritual experience. And yes, that's there too, but it's come, we must come in worship in the sense that we want to serve, serve the Lord and serve others. And this is what Paul is really reiterating the point. For we may all prophesy one by one, verse 31, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And this is what he's talking about when we come as one. For God is not, a, not the author of confusion, but of peace. So that when someone who hasn't seen these things before should be able to come in and see the Spirit of God working in the, in the church, but not be thrown off by it. That you, they shouldn't be seen as, well, these guys are a little bit crazy. No, he's saying it must be done in verse 39, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy. In other words, to you know, seek out those things to build and forbid not the speaking with tongues. In other words, it's not a bad thing that you speak in tongues in, in church, but it must be done. Let all things be done decently and in order. And that is paramount. 
And when we come together, our worship must be worship, our worship must be done in spirit and in truth and abounding in love for the building of the church. Okay? Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves. And we know that, especially in these sorts of times, you know, it's a warning for us that things must be done decently in order. But I want to uh, refer to, to um, Matthew 15 and verse um, 7. Jesus is, is saying, um, and he and refers to a prophecy done by um, Isaiah. And he said, you hypocrites. You know, Isaiah was right in what he prophesied. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You know, it's a warning to anybody. If your heart is not in the right place, if you're not worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, you're actually a bit of a hypocrite. You, you need to make sure that your heart is in the right place. And we know this is talking about the, 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 the Pharisees at that time, but it's a warning. When we worship him, it must be done in spirit and in truth. It cannot be mechanical or mundane. There you go, I've said it. You know, if you're mechanical in your worship, it's, it's, it's not exactly worship, is it? When you come to, to church, it must be from an abundance of love and of giving. And this is what Paul is reiterating. You know, can you grow in your sincerity in your worship? Well, of course you can. And you do that um, by, by spirit and in truth, in, in true and honest. You know, we need to put our side, our side, our own selves and we must worship him and that worship must come from a place of love and sincerity. And I'm going to finish uh, just a reference. Galatians 6, verse 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. He knows where you come from, where he knows where you, you, your, um, your worship comes from. Let's not, let's not be weary in well-doing, for in due season if we shall reap, we shall reap if we faint not. You know, and as we have the opportunity to, un- to do good to unto all men, especially unto them that come in the household of faith. So it's important that we are spiritually transformed. We're set apart for his purpose, who worship God in spirit and in truth, and ensure that we put aside our own self-seeking and vanity and ensuring that we're serving the Lord and the saints. Amen. Another volume, uh, magnificent round of applause. Thank you, Pastor Chris. All right, look, just uh, Pastor Chris said that the word many times, sincerity there. And uh, in the world of religion, in the world of Pentecost, perhaps charismatic churches, there's a lot of one-upmanship, there's a lot of show ponyism. And uh, God is looking for sincerity in our worship and our approaches to him. And also in insincerity in our pr- approach to what he has said in scripture and we've just read some of that together and uh, some churches they'll have you falling over in the spirit laughing in the spirit coughing up demons squirming around and at the moment we've all seen clips on facebook perhaps of you know particularly well-known preachers over in america casting demons out of COVID 19 and you name it they'll say anything And they'll do anything if they think they can get away with it. And we're told in Scripture that we should be sincere and all things should be done decently and in order, as we've heard today. And there again is another way that here in the revival centres we shine the light on worship and praise and all the people said. All right, my pleasure now to introduce our final... Oh, not our final, we've got Pastor Jeff a bit later on, but uh, Pastor Lewis Miles. And his, his topic is the shine... The light we shine on doctrine. Hey everybody, great to be here and discuss from the Word of God and um, just talking today about doctrine and perhaps in the modern world and perhaps in modern Christianity, the word doctrine maybe isn't the favourite word we like to use because it's almost a slight contradiction because if you come to, you've come out of a religious background perhaps and you come to Christianity, you come to know Christ and we're sort of, we're not under law, you know, we're, we've got the freedom of, of God and we become an individual and um, we kind of think, do we really want to be held back by these boundaries 
um, that, of what we call doctrine. And Jesus himself, when he came on the scene, people marveled at Jesus' doctrine because it was a doctrine of power. And I just wanted to sort of discuss today that the doctrine that we have doesn't sort of bring us in, it doesn't hold us back. But what it does is it gives us an opportunity to illuminate the Word of God and to grow in the Spirit, to grow in the fruit of the Spirit that we've been given. There's nothing we're held back through doctrine, but what it does is it keeps us in tight so that we can work with each other in a church setting. Um, Jesus said to love God and to love one another. And if we bring into the doctrine our own, our, our own ideals, worldly ideals, and we try to mix them in with the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Jesus, we dilute, we dilute the main points that we've been given. And we've heard today about the, the spiritual aspect of being born again. And when we add things into the doctrine on top of what we've been given, we lose a sense of hierarchy of what's important because there's just too many things. And some of the doctrines which sort of are added into modern day Christianity, the doctrine of, the doctrine of prosperity, superstition, politics, religion, mysticism, if these things are put in, we don't know, we lose our tracking of weighing up how important is it to be spirit-filled, how important is baptism when we've sort of got these other things to pray about as well and these other sort of things that we're adding in too and we lose our footing. And so it's important that we do still have these sort of set boundaries we've been given and we sort of read today about how within these boundaries we still flourish as much as we can. And if we turn now to Ezekiel 44, there's just a little story here that um, I want to sort of bring to life a little bit. Ezekiel 44, verse 10, and this is at the end of a, you know, like a, it's Ezekiel's vision, it's not exactly a, a 10 minute talk. Um, but we just have here, there's two types that we get given in this little passage, and it's an instruction to the priests. And there were Levites which strayed away from the word of God, and there was another type which, which kept the things of God. One went away and one stayed. And we read here in verse 10, these are the ones that went away. And the Levites that had gone away far from me, when Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols, and that's searching after other doctrines, they shall even bear their iniquities, yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house, ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. And verse 14, but I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof and for all, the, all that shall be done therein. So what you've got here is you've got these guys that have gone astray, but they still have to minister in the house. They've still got to do stuff for God, but they're not in the inner bit. They're not really in the power of God. They're just, they're just sort of doing the temple type stuff, cleaning the house. And they have to watch as the other group are in their midst and they're in the inside enjoying being with God. Verse 15, and these are these, but the priests of the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. And this is an extraordinary verse because what God's saying is these guys get so close to me that they get to eat with me. They get to minister unto me, which means to give praise to God, and they get to offer up the fat and the blood, which is at God's table, and you just get to see how close they are to God. And when Jesus came on the scene, he said, you know, you need to abide in me as I abide in you. And doctrine is about staying close to God, okay? It's about staying um, within grasp that um, you're not trying to add anything else in that doesn't need to be there. The other ones which went astray, they had to look in at these sons of Zadok being close to God from the outside. And that's, that would be a painful thing to, you know, to spend your whole life in this service only to then be on the outside and you're just putting the food on the table. You're not even being a part of the whole thing. 
And sadly, probably what you have today is um, through religion and things is people who are doing all the things. They're cleaning the temple, they're doing all the stuff, but they're looking, when it comes to the real power, they're looking from the outside, looking in. They're not ministering unto God. They're not eating and drinking with the Lord. They're not in the midst of it. And that would be the worst spot to possibly be in. Um, we don't want to dilute what we've been given. The boundaries that we've been given, and, and look, this whole part of Ezekiel is all about boundaries, and if you read on about the priests of Zadok, the boundaries that they get given, they get given more boundaries. They have to wear linen and not wool, and um, they have all these little things they get given to, and it'd be an honour to do them, to know that God gives you extra boundaries because you're a little closer to Him. Wouldn't you want to take them on? You know, when we get given the doctrine we've been given, wouldn't you want to take it on because... It's an honour to be given these type of boundaries. Um, A few years ago, we went overseas and, you know, you have a 24-hour flight and I play, I just play chess and and things for hours on end. And we went to France and if, and what's good about overseas is when you walk around, there's a lot of old guys who just sit there at these marketplaces with chess boards and they just sit there waiting for you to come to play chess with them. And, um, you know, they're not overly well dressed, They're, they're... badly shaven, and they stink a bit. They're just these old guys that sit there and they've got these chess boards and, um, and you sort of come up to them and they, there's no English and even if you tried to, they'd want to speak in French and you, you, you give them a couple of euro and you get to play them and they kill you, of course. Like These guys are better than grandmasters. These guys are ridiculously good and um, they don't even try to take your pieces. They just checkmate you before you realise what's happened. And uh, you go up to them and you say, oh, yeah, can I play? And they kind of just grumble as if, like, you know, I have to put up playing against you. They kind of see, oh, yeah, this would be the easiest two euros I've ever made. And uh, you're done in about five minutes. And what, what's funny with the game of chess is you can play it anywhere in the world and 64 squares, nothing changes. The, the game hasn't changed in 500 years. And it's really the ultimate game because you, you don't even have to talk to the person. There's just a table there. You just rock up and you just play, walk away and leave. And you don't have to even talk about it. What makes chess the ultimate game is that the, the boundaries are the same. They never move and they can't move at all. But within the game itself, there's just an infinite number of moves and creativity and perfection and beauty within the game. But all of that is given by the boundaries. See, only with boundaries do you get beauty and complexion and all the things that you've been given and in the Garden of Eden was described as beautiful and it was marked off, it had boundaries, everything else, everything in life, if you, if you ever talk to an artist they'll tell you that they don't see in infinite numbers and colours, they, they see in boundaries, they see the opposites of colour and shade and things and what they have is a, a way of looking at the world that by you, when you know what boundaries you have, you get to play more when you're in it. And when we've been given the boundaries of what God's given us, we get to play properly because we know what we've been given. And we don't lose the hierarchy of what makes sense. You know, if you go play chess with someone and you say, okay, well, look, when I play, castles get to go diagonal. Suddenly, you don't get to play anymore because, and, and no one gets to play. The game's done. That's why AFL kind of sucks a bit because, you know, the, the rules change every week. And, no, and, and even the players don't know how it works, so... Um, let's go now to 1 John chapter 2. To grow and to get closer to God, we have to look within the boundaries we've been given and they're not restrictions. What they are, uh, they're a way that we get to uh, express ourselves, We've all got the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit. And, and these are things which we get to extrapolate on over years. You know, you, 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 things change and you get to explore the Word of God in different ways. We're not short of complexity, that's for sure. If we add in things into the doctrine from the outside and we put in, we actually, you would actually think, oh, wouldn't you just get more stuff to play with if you added more things in? But you don't because... The things which actually work, the power of God, the doctrine of Jesus, which was a doctrine of power, is no longer there because it's diluted with other things added in. We read here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 24, Let that for there abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. 
If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. The things which we abide from from the beginning. And this is the promise he has promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, and that sort of links as being deceived. Verse 27, this is a good verse. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, that is to go searching for other doctrines, other ideas to get put in, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie, even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. And this, I like the first one, you know, go back to what you've got from the beginning, you know. There's nothing greater when we first come to the Lord and we get given things. And if you want to add to the doctrine of Jesus, think about how it would affect someone who's new to it. Think of how it would affect people in other countries where it's hard to discuss. Think, think about how it would affect millions of people. The doctrine we have must be consistent so that it can be communicated and it can be played properly. And uh, it says here, you know, need not that any man teach you. And one of the things which we can do is get impressed by things which are not of the gospel. And if we do slightly feel ourselves getting impressed by something, by all means be impressed, put it into the place that it is though, don't bring it into the church, you know. Any private revelation, great, keep it for yourself, it's good. Anything else which is not of the gospel, it doesn't add to the good news, it doesn't add to the church because, and this takes down to the law, that the law is put into that to love God and to love your neighbour. If we love our neighbour, we will keep the doctrine, something that can be communicated properly and something which can be shared. And that really brings in the love that God's given us, that we can share things properly. Otherwise, everything else becomes selfish and it's actually not beneficial to everyone around us. Um, we grow in the fruit of God. And look, in Psalm 115, we won't turn to it, but just quickly, there's, it says of those that worship idols... And it's a powerful chapter. It says that if you worship them, you become like them. You lose sensation in your lips, your mouth, you can't speak. Your feet can't move. You lose your voice, you lose your eyes, you lose your ears. Everything's lost in sensation. It's like, a, it's like an anesthesia that comes over you because you lose the sensation of what you've been given. And we don't want to ever lose the sensation that we've got by adding extra things in. This is sort of a scarier thing to think about. When you're in a plane trip, and I'll just sort of finish with this, and you drop about 100 metres, and your palms get sweaty, your heart rate goes up, your knees get tight, and um, your body is quickly into this sort of fight or flight type mode. It, it's inevitable, it happens to everyone, and you get these warning signs that perhaps something's gone wrong. You've just dropped 100 metres in the air. When you walk away from the Lord, the scary thing is there's zero warning signs. Your palms don't get sweaty. Nothing happens. You get, it's like an anesthesia. You lose sensation. You're hearing things, but nothing's coming in. And you slowly and slowly lose sensation and feeling of what you've been given. And that's something which is slightly frightening because you, would, you won't see it as it happens. And that's why we have to keep sharp. It's why we have to keep praying. And uh, if it ever gets to a point where you don't want to pray, that's when you need to pray because you're, you need that sensation. You need to come back to the things it says here, you know, come back to which you've heard from the beginning. That's where we need to be. Amen. Well done, Pastor Lewis. And again, all the people said, great metaphors. The chess thing, wow, you know, good stuff. I'll remember that one for the rest of my life. All right, now we're going to, um, we've got Pastor Jeff Beggs now, and he's, uh, he helps out here in Melbourne. You would have seen him on the stream many, 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 many times. And he's going to do like a, a more or less like a summary of the light we shine. And he's going to be presenting a PowerPoint presentation Let's hand over now to Pastor Jeff Beggs. 
Hello, and it's really good to see you. And I'm saying that to people who are actually here in the audience. And if you're sitting at home on your couch and you're feeling pretty cool, uh, just recognise that there's a few of us actually here. And uh, it, it's been a long time. Uh, it's been good. All right, I'm going to put... There's going to be a slide come up, no doubt, in a moment. And I'm going to be talking about the light we shine. And it's a little bit more of a metaphor uh, today, another metaphor, uh, and of course, or an analogy. And that's all we can really get. And the Bible's sort of full of ways of describing who God is and our relationship with Him. And it puts it in terms that are, um, you know, that help us understand because they relate to things that we can see. So I'm going to talk about the light we shine. And I've got three things I'm going to talk about quite quickly. Light and dark, full spectrum, and shine. So light and dark. Uh, now, you, some of you know that I quite like art. And I've been looking at the fact that you, you can get a piece of art, and don't worry about the subject material. It's, you know, it looks religious, probably is. Um, but, but what I want you to see there is that wonderful light on that little baby. In fact, if you look quite closely, you'll see the baby has the big, world's biggest nose. And I, and I reckon in those days that they didn't always have a baby as a model, so they just got an adult and said, look, I'll just do you and I'll make your head smaller. So you can look at that later, it's quite hilarious, really. But as you're looking at that, you, you think, wow, that baby is sort of almost emitting light. Um, here's another one. This is a pretty famous painting. Um, I can't remember who it's by now. Um, Joseph Wright of Derby. And, um, and uh, he's got this uh, picture of a... Uh, of an experiment being done and don't worry about the context just look at how the light is there you can see all the light and this is a pretty uh, famous one this is uh, girl with a pearl earring by uh, Vermeer and her face just glows look at her face there it's just a light so that's actually a little bit of her face I've just shown you a little bit of her face and you can see how it sort of really glows there but if I put it against a white background all of a sudden it looks dark and I'm just going to talk here about the idea of contrast. And so you look at this face, the girl with the pearl, pearl earring, and the reason her face is, seems to be glowing there is because it's in contrast to the dark. And we see this in other parts of our life. You can look up at the sky at night and you see all these little uh, bits of light. It's just sensational. If you go to somewhere away from light, uh, you know, uh, um, artificial light, it's even more dramatic how beautiful all these stars are shining in the sky. But once the sun comes into the sky, you can't see it. It's just flooded out. And, uh, you know, therefore, um, you can't see it. There's no contrast. In fact, if all we have is light, we have a word for that. We call it glare. You know, it's just hitting you full in the face. And it's so bright, you can't tell what's going on. And there's some examples of this given in the Bible. You can read about Moses, who went up uh, uh, into the mountain. And when he came down, uh, he had to put a veil over his face because he'd been with God. And his face shone so much that the children of Israel said, we can't stand to look at you. In another spot, Moses said to God, show me your glory, said Moses. And God said, if I showed you my glory, you'd be dead. You would die. Tell you what I'll do, I'll put you in this little cleft of the rock and I'll go past and when I've gone past you can sort of look at, uh, you know, behind uh, of me and see some, a little bit of reflected glory, uh, otherwise you'll die. Jesus, when he came upon the scene, the Bible said of him that he was a light that shined in darkness but the darkness comprehended it not. And so he was the Lord and he was representing uh, God, of course, and uh, in the fullness of, of, of the Godhead dwelt in him, we read in Colossians just the other day. You know, the light shines in darkness, but the, but the darkness, from the darkness's perspective, it's just glare, it's just too much. I can't take it in, I don't understand it. And that was pretty much what happened to, G to Jesus. They didn't understand him, they put him to death, uh, it was too much. The Bible talks about our relationship with God as, as light having come into our life. And it says this, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And this is getting across the idea that God puts his light in us, uh, mere human beings. In fact, he, Paul goes on to say this, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And because we have this uh, treasure in our earthen vessels, people don't look at you and say, oh, wow, there's the light of God shining. But they do see that there's something going on. There's a little, there's a little bit of, what is it about that guy? 
and uh, that's if your testimony is glowing. That's how people might uh, see you and think of you. Uh, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and part of that, and I, I don't want to overcook all this because it's just a bit of thinking, but a part of that is, is the fact that if it, we were just emitting the glory of God, people wouldn't even be able to look at us. Uh, that, that's how it would be. And so we have this treasure, this wonderful spirit of God placed within us uh, in these earthen vessels. And it makes us a little bit more relatable to everybody else. And so we have the opportunity to tell people about God without, in one sense, overwhelming them. Um, so here's, here's a really great scripture. I hope you can sort of make it out there. W what do you think of it so far? Ah, oh, it's quite interesting, you know, if the light, if the contrast isn't there, if you don't shine a bit, you know, in your life... People just think you're like anybody else. Um, and so, oh, oh, <laughs> the lights come on. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so Jesus said, let your light shine. You, you, you know, let them see who you are and what I'm about. Uh, but remember, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, talking about just our body. And so we are at the moment representing God in the world. And it says of our time in the world that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, a nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And one of the reasons we do stand out is because of the darkness that is around. So there are things to ponder. I'm going to talk about full spectrum. So the idea of full spectrum, who remembers <laughs> science? <laughs> you know, who, who remembers their electromagnetic spectrum? I, we're not, it's all right, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this one. But you may remember it's, it's quite long. It does all those things. We've got radio waves at one end and gamma rays at the other. And, and right there, sort of in that little, very thin little bit, is what's called the spectrum of visible light. And we see that. Uh, you know, we've got red at one end, we've got blue at the other. It goes off into ultraviolet. And we've got yellow sort of somewhere around the middle. And as we look at these things, well, if you just look at it full on, that's all you see. In, in full spectrum light, everything uh, at the same intensity, you end up with white light, which is very pretty, but you can't see anything in it. However, the Lord has, in, in, uh, you know, in physics, he's set all this up, and I reckon the Lord can see the whole spectrum, but you know, that's, just, that's just my surmising. Uh, but we have this what's called the visible spectrum. And if we're going to represent God, we need to represent all of him. And so we, hear, we read this scripture in Romans, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God, on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. He's talking about the people of Israel. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And so we have this idea that God isn't sort of always warm and cuddly. And you might think of that as like the red end of the spectrum. You know, God's love, we've been hearing about that, and so he is. Um, but God's also righteousness and judgment. We might think about that as the blue end of the spectrum. And somewhere in the middle there around the yellow, you might say, well, that's kind of like justice. And sometimes God's merciful, and, and sometimes people don't, don't uh, you, you know, work out how to access his mercy, and, um, and they end up in trouble. And we come across other scriptures. You know, Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life. That's kind of at the warm and cuddly end, I suppose. And that they might have it more abundantly. But then maybe at the blue end there, he's saying, suppose you that I'm come to give peace on the earth. I tell you no, but rather division. And there he's talking about the fact that when you make your approach to God, it's you. You're the one who makes the approach. Um, and sometimes your family doesn't even like it. And that's what he's saying. That's what might happen. He talks about the example of people uh, who were, had been killed in an accident. A big tower at Siloam had fell on a whole bunch of people. And Jesus said, do you think they were sinners more than anybody else? And he said, no, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And you might think, well, there's a bit more at the blue end of the spectrum. And so uh, we read here in Jude and talks about our approach to people. And it says, of some have compassion making a difference maybe they're sort of read in telling them about how good things are going to be and how god loves you all this is true and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh some people respond to the fact that they recognize that god is uh, righteous and he will judge and the idea is to take hold of course as the sacrifice of jesus in your life um, and have the judgment passed through his death and uh, and 
and through repentance and baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit, I come to know Him in spirit and in truth. But we're just sort of making the point here that there's a spectrum of uh, God's approach because God's more complex than people perhaps make Him out. You know, if we just talk about God's wonderful love to everybody, you might get the wrong impression that you can do what you like and it doesn't matter. If we just spoke about God's uh, uh, righteousness and judgment, we might think there's no hope for us and there's nothing we can do about it. If we spend our time thinking about the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the equity, some, somewhere there in the middle that God's sometimes merciful and sometimes judgeful and so on, well, we'd have that kind of picture. But when you put those three colours together, you get beauty. And so what we have here is God's uh, putting across to us that he is a complex being, you know, that he has nuances in his approach, that he sees all things from one end to the other, and that when you put all those things, we are talking about the jigsaw puzzle earlier, all those pieces are together, you start to come up with this picture, and the picture is beautiful. And it's out of those colours, if you know, if you know a bit of art, that you can create all of these things, you know, light and dark, and that those three colours, you put them all together and blend them and you get all this beauty. And of course, God put all this, I'm only using it as an analogy, it's not perfect. But all these things are put together and they show us that our picture of God that we put forward to others, it needs to be a full spectrum picture. The Bible tells us to shine. A couple of uh, slides on this. We read uh, that the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of of light and uh, really our role in the Lord is to be illuminating the path for others uh, that they may see the way to go and uh, to show them from the scriptures from the word of God uh, that there is a way to go and to show them through your life and your experience that we know that we have an answering God and uh, and that this isn't just some uh, exercise of um, of semantics or something, uh, but rather we have an answering God who will answer you personally and directly. And it's wonderful to be able to put forward such a clear, direct message again, as we heard earlier. And then we, of course, think about our future and what's to come because our life isn't just this life. There is much more to come. And the Bible says of us, those of us filled with the Spirit of God who have come to know Him in spirit and truth, that the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. And uh, that's the light we shine. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. I, he just gets better and better with every presentation, doesn't he? All right, we're going to, before I just summarise at the end of the day, for those that are at home that have received the Holy Spirit, uh, we often talk about communion, and you'll be taking your communion in the uh, safety of your own house. And so I've asked our Pastor Silvio now, he's going to say a few words and shine some light on communion. Thanks, Pastor Sil. How good has it been? It's amazing, isn't it? Um, a lot of the things that I was going to talk about today were actually brought in by all the previous speakers because the Word of God is one, the message is one. And it, in all its simplicity, we hear a lot of different versions because of the complexity of our thinking. But the gospel is very simple. And, uh, and it starts with this. The very first communion was in the garden. Man had communion with God. He walked and talked with him and he partook of his goodness. And then that communion was broken. Man fell and uh, it, had, it was restored by Jesus Christ by his death and his resurrection. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed, and uh, which symbolized that the way was made open for us to partake of the communion, which is the same word. To partake and to commune is, is they're synonymous because when you're communing, you're partaking of a conversation, you're partaking of a meal, but it's a, it's, it's a relationship. And when we come together, uh, to take communion, it's more than just taking a piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice. And there's a lot of things. Some people will tell you it's got to be the alcoholic wine, but it couldn't have been because uh, in the uh, Passover feast, according to the, the laws of God, uh, nothing fermented was allowed to be uh, used in the Passover feast. So there was not, not to be any fermented bread. Uh, it was called unleavened bread. And there was not to be any fermented wine. 
because the word uh, there is seor, which means a corrupted. Uh, it's, uh, uh, God doesn't allow anything that is fermented, whether the seor is in the bread or the seor is in the wine, it wasn't allowed. And this is what Pastor Jeff and the others were talking about. Uh, in the church, it's the same way. And when we come together, we've come together to do more than take a little piece of bread and drink a little bit of grape juice. And um, what we've come together to do is to remember the wonderful situation that we find ourselves in, that we have the opportunity to commune with God, that uh, we've been taken out of darkness, put into light. And um, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to consider ourselves. So uh, it's an opportunity to be absolutely honest and brutal with ourselves without condemning ourselves. Because Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So the little light we want to shine about communion, because you all know, the world knows the ceremony that's come to be known as uh, communion. But what is it for? What do we use it for as spirit-filled, born-again Christians? Walking and talking with God every day. Once a week we get together. And there's no rule about it being once a week, but we do that as a matter of habit. We Once a week we come together as the body of Christ, which represents the bread, the whole, the one loaf. And we consider our contribution, which we heard uh, from Pastor Chris. What is our contribution? Is it for the good of the church? Is it for the edifying of the church? Or is it a selfish uh, reason we're here. Give me this, the Bless Me Club. Are we part of the Bless Me Club? Give me this, give me that. I need this, I need that. There's no thought about why am I here to contribute? How am I here to, uh, to upbuild and, and contribute to the church? It's really, Lord, I've got this and I've got that problem. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, in verse 24, I'm just using a slightly different uh, translation called the Passion. It says, my cherished friends, keep on running far away from idolatry. Idolatry is anything that is, uh, replaces God, that replaces God's doctrine, God's way of living and thinking. I know I'm writing to thought people, thoughtful people, so carefully consider and uh, uh, assess and judge what I say. You know, so it's, and in there, Paul goes on, please read it in your own time. He asks them, to consider that what they're doing is cooperating. They're communing with God when we get together as a church. And uh, we, we, we commune with God 24-7, 365. But when we come together as a church, we've got to consider our part, our role in the church. Are we uh, destructive? Are we selfish? Are we bringing in leaven into the church? Uh, the, Jesus talked about the leaven of the Pharisees. And uh, he talked about the uh, Galatians 5 talks about the leaven of human nature, which is greed and malice and envy. And uh, we're not to bring that leaven into the fellowship. Uh, yes, we do have it. Paul talks in chapter 7 of, uh, of Romans, and he talks about the battle with the leaven that was in his head, in all our heads. It's called our old human nature. Before we were baptized and received the Holy Spirit, we had the leaven that was corrupting us and we were going to die. But Jesus Christ crucified that leaven called our mortality, our corrupted state. And uh, literally, uh, when it talks about he, uh, he overcame death, he put death to death in that sense, he paralyzed. So while we still have a human nature, if we believe it, the sin nature that lives in us has been paralyzed by the Holy Spirit as long as we stay with the Holy Spirit and walk in that. So we come together to consider all these things and our contribution, whether we are really uh, participating and partaking of the bread and are we contributing to the bread. You know, no man is an island. You are part, if you've been baptized, if you've repented, you've been baptized, you've received the Holy Spirit, you're walking on with the Lord, you are not an island. You are part of a spiritual ecosystem called the body of Christ. And like in any ecosystem, and we heard about that from Pastor Joel, is that you have an impact. Uh, when cells in a human body 
start to become selfish. They try to get everyone to look and talk like them. They try to turn every cell around them into them. They're not interested in the function of the body. They're interested in them. Be like me. Listen to me. Follow me. And that's called cancer. Diseases. So when we take the bread, we're thinking about the body of Christ. We're thinking about, are we corrupting that body with our own ideas and our own thoughts? Or as uh, Pastor Lewis was talking about, maintaining the doctrine that was once and for all delivered to the saints. We don't need to change it. We don't need to alter it. It's perfect. The Psalms tells us that the law of God, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So let's think about that because let's, it's the greatest opportunity because we have the opportunity to be honest with ourselves without wanting to jump off a bridge because we know that we've been cleansed and set free and we can be honest about ourselves as we take this communion. Consider all the things you've heard today. Please put them into your consideration. Then take the communion because we know that with our Old nature, we don't want to do what God wants. But with our new nature, that's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we pray in tongues. Because the Spirit in Romans 8 says, 28 says, the Spirit comes to our help. Because we don't know how we should pray. So as we come together for communion, really consider your place in the body of Christ, the bread. And that uh, the, the blood... The wine, the, the scriptures tell us that the life is in the blood. The spirit is the life of God. And uh, we all know what happens if a disease or a bacteria gets into the blood. It floods the body. And, uh, and, the, and in this sense, the spirit represents our thinking. If we allow false doctrines, if we allow our old human nature to come back into our walk, and then we try to bring that into the church, we become like that virus and we spread our thinking, which is the life. The spirit in the, in the Hebrew represents thinking and our thoughts. And so if the ancient Hebrews understood it that way. It was always the problem God had was with man's thinking. And if we let the leaven get in our thinking and then think we're going to come into the fellowship and bring that leaven, we're like a bacteria or a virus in the blood. It goes through the body. And that's what Pastor Jeff was touching on that we've got to look after the church and the, sometimes we have to say no because we're protecting the body. Um, so let's, I just want to finish with this. It's very important for us not to come to communion and just see it very lightly. Paul talks about that because of they're not uh, considering the body, many people were getting very sick and some of them were dying. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, folks. Uh, sometimes we just get sick anyway. It doesn't matter how faithful we've been. I, it's always, always seems to happen to me. So here's some points I want you to think about as you go into the, your communion service. One, we've been set free and we must not become enslaved again to sin and the ways of this world. Galatians 5.1 says it was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating, liberating us. Therefore, keep standing firm and don't be subject again to the yoke of slavery which you were once removed from. Two, we must not even allow a small amount of compromise with our flesh or false doctrines in our lives personally or in the church. Don't do it. Because then you become like a rogue cell in the body. You are not an island. Yes, you are an individual. And every cell in the body is individual. But the cells that corrupt the body, the body recognizes as being a threat. So it's contrary to what people think about today. Um, it says here, Jesus said to them, and this is what's important about doctrine, which Pastor Lewis touched on. Uh, Matthew 16, 12, uh, Jesus was talking to the disciples and they didn't understand when he told them about the leaving of the Pharisees, the religious leaders. He said, they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the false teaching, the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, um, you know, we can't allow that in the church today. We can't allow that in our mind because it will corrupt us. So I want to finish right here. It says, I love this. James 6, we sang it today. Uh, verse 6, yeah, I'm reading from the Amplified. Humble yourselves with an attitude of repentance and insignificance. 
in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. He will lift you up and he will give you purpose. In the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. The Lord will return and the last trump, the, uh, the archangel will blow that last trumpet and we will be caught up to meet him in the air. He will lift us up if we remain humble. If we put aside our own thoughts, if we put aside our own ideas, if we keep ourselves free from the leaven of human nature, of our old human nature, human thinking, if we keep ourselves free from religious doctrines and embrace the wonderful freedom we've been placed in. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 is my final verse. It says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And this is what we're celebrating every time we take communion. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, which is our daily communion with God. It's not a once a week thing, but as a church, we come together once a week. Not with old leaven, nor with leaven of vice, malice and wickedness. It's talking about communion. It's talking about what we've got to think about as we approach that, the privileged position we're in to be Call the sons and daughters of the living God to participate in the living bread, which the church is. It's not just that Jesus Christ is the bread of life, um, but it's when you come to church and you fellowship with the body, Jesus is the head of that body. And don't, um, so it's talking about here, don't bring vice, malice, envy. Don't bring resentment. Don't bring anger. Don't hold grudges. Let it all go. And then... Take your communion cup. There's no condemnation. It's not saying don't take it. It's saying please consider where you are, commit it to the Lord, and then take your communion and the Lord will work with you. You know, it says, but with the leavened, unleavened bread of sincerity, which is Pastor Simon's uh, contribution today. He did other things too. <laughs> and, uh, and untainted truth. I want to live there. Really think about it. Don't take uh, communion as a light thing. Really understand the privilege, the position of partaking of what coming to church is all about. Um, is you're, you're here, as Pastor Chris said, to contribute. You're here to encourage, to uplift. And uh, consider that and consider what you're going to do for the Lord. Because as you do that, whatever you need will be added unto you. Thank you, Pastor Sill. And again, all the people said. All right, we've come to the end. And look, I must uh, send a, a heartfelt thank you to all our pastors that have ministered to us today. Great work, gentlemen. Thank you to Pastor Sill for that uh, just then. And uh, we've got a couple of announcements. I just wanted to just finalise on something about us as a church. You know, when we talk about doctrine, when we talk about teaching, when we talk about what we do, it needs to be safe. And all the people said, you know, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 that we know, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. It needs to be unified. It needs to be wise. It needs to be godly. And it needs to be holy. And it's, we're told in Ephesians 5 that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And we must do our best to make sure that we administer the word of God, that we deliver the word of God, and that uh, we don't embellish on the word of God. And all the people said. All right, just, uh, I think we've got an announcement about uh, young peoples. Does that, that's it there. This is uh, closer to God. That's very apt. The 2022nd rally next year. Uh, 21 to the 26th of January, that's the Australia Day weekend, isn't it? Yep, more details to come, contact Dane or Hannah. So that's uh, coming up next year and that's a great topic, closer to God. All right, on our outro this afternoon, we've got a, an item again from Hawke's Bay and this is Nina Blair and she's got a song called The Vine. So we just uh, say our final doxology now. We thank you for being as he with us here today. On Wednesday night, Pastor Jeff and I will be having a bit of a chat. We've got to work that out yet, haven't we? But we'll be having a chat again on our Wednesday night stream and, uh, and there'll be more information to you then for those people watching on Facebook, etc., about getting back to fellowship face-to-face -face 
as uh, the rules uh, slowly opened up for us uh, in our church. All right, folks, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace until Jesus comes. Amen. me no more.